The future will be great, but today is just as incredible. Meet Nissan's most advanced lineup. If you can't get enough adrenaline, there's the all-new 400 HP Nissan Z. Or for your off-road adventures, check out the all-terrain Nissan Frontier. And for something more electric, there's the stylish Nissan Aria. So let's enjoy the ride. 2023 RNZ not yet available for purchase. Expected availability this spring for 2023Z and this fall for 2023 Aria. Look. This is hot, Ray. Symmetrical book stacking. Just like the Philadelphia Mass Turbulence of 1947. You're right. No human being would stack books like this. Listen. You smell something? Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's The Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and are you listening to this at 3 in the morning? If so, you might be one of the people celebrated by National Third Shift Workers Day which is today. Here to help you with your career, no matter what time of day or night it occurs, we welcome the author of Power of Connection, Vincent Puglisi. In headlines, financial advisors are working longer. How come? And now, two guys who are ready to help you begin the slide into Friday, it's Joe and O-J-J-J-J-G. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the introduction to the second half of your week. I am Joe Saul C. Hi, Average Joe Money on Twitter. And what a special week we've had, a special Tuesday episode. And now we're back for more. We got the gang here. Mr. OG sitting across the card table with me. Coffee ready? It's ready. Full of caffeine. You got the uh, vocal cords warmed up? Uh, yeah, I've been yelling at my kids all morning, so... Perfect. <laughs> Great intro to the show. Doug said we're sliding into Friday. They're sliding into the end of the school year and having a very tough time oh. staying motivated. I remember those days in school just looking out the window, like in fourth grade, mm-hmm. going, oh, man, we're almost mm-hmm. there. It's that time. Well, yeah. and in Michigan, they had to crack the windows at this time of year because the heat was still on in the building because they wouldn't oh. convert it over. Oh. So that they crack the window and you get that great spring air coming in. And yeah, there was just no way you were focusing. My co-author, Emily Guy Birkin, and I on this book tour, we've been talking about that. It just We were at a library in Milwaukee and they had the heat on the day before it had been 45 degrees, but now it's 70. So you don't know what to do. Do you turn the heat on? Do you not turn the heat on? The good news is uh, the Wauwatosa Library uh, provided a sauna for us, which I owe them a big, big thank you. <laughs> On that note, OG, we got Vincent Puglisi here today talking about the power of connection today. We're talking financial advisors and longevity, a career that seems to keep on going. But first. Down here uh, where I live, Doug, it's uh, pretty nice. 80 degrees, 90 degrees, wow. kind of sunny. Everybody up by you yeah. is talking about fake spring. It snowed. It snowed a day or two ago. Here. See, you know, fake spring. The problem is, is, you know, how do you, how do you get ready? How do you dress around that time? Difficult to find the right outfit for spring. Every day is different. The weather changes. Snows in Michigan. It's sunny and hot in Texas. Luckily, Faraday makes it way easier. They make perfect clothes for all seasons. Faraday, you probably know this already, Doug, but they're a family run brand making high quality, timeless clothing, modern design and functionality. It's that kind of effortless style that you want every time you go digging through your closet. Effortless is key for me. I was going to say, that's what I think of when I look at you. Effortless style. Effortless. I, effortless for sure. Maybe you need the effortless style part of it, and you can get some stuff from Faraday. We got some things from them. I decided to order Mrs. OG some clothes. I know Joe likes his shirt. How did that go? That rarely goes well. It went great. I said, sweetheart, check out this new brand that I'd like you to check out. And she went, ooh, how about this shirt and shorts? And I was like, they look pretty, pretty cute. Did you get the size right? Because that's another place. That's a, that's a landmine you can step on. Well, you always just go smaller and let them return it. The way that I did it was I said, go to this website and buy some stuff and uh, tell me <laughs> what you think. very thoughtful of you. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> she loves it. And um, for what it's worth, 
think they look pretty good. Faraday's so confident in the quality of their stuff, they have a lifetime guarantee. Wow. They'll replace or fix your clothes forever, no matter what. Even if you get too fat? Not that that would happen to me. I think you'd have to like structure it under the seams ripped. Which will definitely happen. Yeah. Right now, Faraday is giving all Stacky Benjamins listeners 20% off. 20% off. Wow. That's, that's one-fifth for those of you that are uh, using fractions still. Going there now. Head to FaradayBrand.com slash stacker and use the code stacker at checkout to snag 20% off all your new spring staples. That's code stacker at Faraday, F-A-H-E-R-T-Y, brand.com slash stacker for 20% off. FaradayBrand.com slash stacker. Using technology, we're moving all over. It's going to be the end of spring. People are going on vacation, but you still have to do work. You still have to check your email. You still have to communicate with your clients. Avast empowers you with digital safety and privacy, no matter who you are, where you are, or how you connect. Enjoy the opportunities that come with being connected on your terms. If you're going to go on vacation, you know, you, st- you can do that. Bring your laptop, connect with Avast, and you're going to be safe and secure. But that's not vacation. Well, it's but it's work from a different location, which is super nice. Avast's new all-in-one solution, Avast One, helps you take control of your safety and privacy online through a range of features. Learn more about Avast One at avast.com. If you're going to be out and about over the next three months as it's summer, you got to have firewall protection. You're going to be checking your work stuff and sending proposals and downloading transactions from your business into your QuickBooks. Like nobody, you don't need people looking at your stuff Keep your personal information secure, prevent attacks that seek to access computers and steal data. If you're sending out emails, if you're sending attachments, if you're getting attachments, you got to stop viruses. Sometimes some 'er ne'er-do-wells will try to, that's a fancy term for bad actors. Some 'er ne'er-do-wells will try to hack your stuff. Award-winning antivirus software that stops viruses and malware from harming your devices. Listen, I'm on the road all the time. We're going to be gone. We're traveling to Michigan for the summer, back and forth Smart. with kids, school, is ending, sports. I need to be connected. I have to have a vast on my computer to make sure that I feel safe and secure. We've got client data that we that we make sure is safe and secure. So you're telling me I shouldn't treat my computer like the glove box in my car because I don't lock that. Look, if they want in, they're getting in. And I'm not I'm not keeping anything good in there anyways, except maybe like the 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 wheel lock so I can change tires. But you're you're saying I should probably put a vast on my glove box in my car. Is that what you're telling me? You might want to do it on your computer anyways. Oh, on the computer. That would be an important, important place. We'd like to thank Avast for supporting our show. Avast prevents over one and a half billion come on with a B attacks every month. And with a vast one, you can confidently take control of your online world without worrying about viruses or phishing attacks or ransomware, or hacking attempts, and other cyber crimes. Learn more about a vast one at avast.com. All right, let's roll into our headlines. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show, our stacking Benjamin's headlines. Our headline today, OG, comes to us from uh, Investment News, and this is written by Jeff Benjamin. This is some good news. You know, when you hear people hating their job, the great resignation, things going poorly for a lot of people at work, and even if they're going well, they're having to step up and get a bunch of courage to ask their boss for an 8.5% raise just to keep up with inflation, which, man, it's a tough time at workplaces all over, whether you're the employer or the employee. Jeff writes... The most seasoned advisors show no signs of slowing down or retiring. A passion for the work drives some financial advisors to stay on the job well past traditional retirement age. While some folks scamper toward a campaign promote as the great resignation that reminds a tidy core of financial advisors who refuse to recognize the notion of retirement despite being well past traditional retirement age. Quote, I retired once when I was 40 because I thought I had enough money, but after a few months, I went back to work, and then at 55, I retired again and played golf for a few months before going back to work, said Joseph Biondo, the 83-year-old founder of Biondo Investment Advisors. They're only helping people manage about $900 million. What's so interesting about this as you scroll through this great piece that Jeff wrote is that uh, financial planning seems to be this career that might be different than 
what's going on with the great resignation? Why do you think that is? Well, I think that uh, it's a lot of factors. The generation that they're talking about. So let's say everybody 60, I mean, shoot, frankly, anybody that's us or older, I think, have a different career path overall. You know, much more sales oriented, much more takes a long time and, you know, to be able to have the money to be able to save for retirement. You don't start your financial planning career or you didn't. 25 years ago with a whole bunch of clients and a hundred thousand dollar salary in a 401k match. You started with no clients and no money and maybe a draw against your commission of 600 bucks every two weeks or something like that. You know, so it takes a lot longer to get to the point where there's extra money in the business to be able to save. So I think that's part of it. The second thing is, is that when you do get to that point, <laughs> there's, it's a generally, okay, profitable business, you know, and if you're doing what you really love to do and you're helping people that you want to help and you're making a good amount of money doing it, why would you want to stop doing those things? So I think that there's two sides to it. One is probably for the people that are getting close to retirement had a different career path than the people that are getting started today, you know, weren't able to save as much early. So they're kind of backfilling. And then secondly, from a a business standpoint, They've got it the way that they want it. They're helping the people that they want to help. They're seeing the number of clients that they want to see. They've got the team that they want to have. Very fulfilling work. Yeah. And they're like, why would I want to stop doing this? This is not a brand new trend. I remember even when I started as a financial advisor and a few times during my career, reading things like this, that financial advisors, for people that can swim that moat, that early years moat, maybe the first three or four years, end up by and large, doing not what I did and leaving after 15, 16 years, but they end up staying forever because it's such a fulfilling place to be. There's more people who are CFPs that are over the age of 80 than are under the age of 30. Holy cow. Which is also not a great thing. Yeah, that creates a disconnect, right? Well, it creates some issues for sure. A dying dying industry, maybe? Uh, It's just a lot different than it was, you know, 25 years ago. Meaning people don't find the CFP certification necessary, but the industry is still growing? There is some of that going on, for sure. 15 years ago, it was 100 bucks every couple of years for your certification, and now it's they just raised the fees again, which nobody's really excited about. It's almost $700 now, and uh, the people who are in charge are making all sorts of money on the CFP board. (laughs) Half a million dollars a year to be the executive director, which is... Good work if you can get it, I suppose. All you have to do is just tell everybody, hey, it's a $100 fee increase. Boom. I just got myself a pay raise. Here comes a raise. There's a lot of controversy going on in that side of it right now. But uh, no, I don't think that it's a dying industry. I just think that it takes a while to earn that. You have to have a a certain amount of experience and education and all that sort of stuff. And, And I actually wasn't worried about the fact that it was a dying industry as much that I was worried about the fact that You've got a disconnect between these really old advisors and young people that say that they're not connecting with advisors, right? I mean, there's old advisors out there that are still saying that they don't understand ESG investing. They don't get uh, cryptocurrency. And I feel like there's this wave of people that have done things a certain way for a long, long time. And I didn't mean to imply that financial planning was a dying industry, really more the, the certification. Yeah. That are are they finding that they can get credibility and and get clients without having those three letters after their name? Yeah, I don't I don't have any insight into that. I I still think that there's a couple three designations that are kind of top of the food chain, so to speak. There's there's lots of things that you can be certified in, and I use air quotes for that. But I think there's two or three that are kind of at the top, and I think CFP is still one of them. But you start turning off people when you know, you're trying to recruit 25 year olds to be CFPs and it's, you know, whatever it is, five or six or $700 a year, you know, that's a pretty significant cost. So I, I, but I also don't know what that is compared to other things. You know, I don't know what that is compared to a CPA. I don't know what that is compared to a CFA or a bar association fee or whatever the case may be. So, um, it may be in line with everybody else's and I'm just belly aching. Well, no, and this is a scary thing. If we talk about people not having the CFP, is it also, OG, that even though shows like ours talk about you should have a certified financial planner, we talk about fiduciary, we talk about all the check boxes, the things that you need that people still, by and large, do not understand any of those designations? 
Well, I do agree that if you're going to work with a financial planner, that you should probably go for a CFP or at least somebody that's moving that direction. You're talking about younger folks that are getting started and, you know, want to find an advisor that's like them, which I think you should do. I think you should find somebody who is uh, experienced in the same things that you're experienced in. Arguably, the 80 year old is probably experienced in it, just his experience was 50 years ago. So it'd be a little different. It's okay to be working toward it. That's, you know, that's an accomplishment that I think is okay to be striving for. I hate the word fiduciary because half the people, not even half, I would say probably 80% of people use it incorrectly, including people who are not, who say, well, no, I am. And you're like, no, you literally cannot be based on your affiliation. And, And so we don't get any emails from the Morgan Stanley folks and the Edward Jones folks. If you're a broker, you cannot be a fiduciary. End of discussion. Period. That that does not mean that you're not doing what's good for your clients. I'm not saying that you're not a good advisor. I'm just saying you can't be a fiduciary. And this is the big problem that the industry has is that we use all these stupid words and they they don't have any meat behind them and people use them incorrectly. So there's no punishment. You know, like if you're a broker and you're a sign bag, you can be like, oh, no, I'm a fiduciary. Like what's what, what happens to you if you say it? Nothing. So you can say whatever the hell you want to say. And then it just, like you said, Joe, it just confuses the public even more. So independent firms or fee-only firms, registered investment advisor firms, try to get the SEC, try to get uh, the regulators to say, hey, no, you got to you got to use this term correctly. But there's too much money and too much pressure from the brokerage side of the business, the Morgan's Merrill's and Wells Fargo's of the world to say, well, we don't really need to. I mean, consumers are smart. They can tell. Again, I'm not saying that if you work at any of those places or you work with one of those people that they're not good. I'm, I'm sure that they are. In fact, I would argue that the vast majority of financial people in the world are, are doing what's in your best interest, that they want to have people in their practice succeed. So, so that's the case. I just think that you use the term incorrectly and then yeah, it's useless. Let's turn this back positive for a second uh, and talk about what a what a career this is that so many people want to get into. I met a uh, woman in Milwaukee who is excited that midway through her career, OG, she quit her job working with a huge consulting firm to get her certified financial planner designation and become a financial planner. Excellent. And she asked me, what's the career path? And I know the career path has changed significantly since you and I began in this field. I began in largely a sales organization, right? And learned all these horrible sales techniques back then, probably not the preferred way to go. What what do you advise people that decide they want to get into this? How do you advise them to make the jump? Well, firstly, I would say don't sell yourself short on the sales techniques. While the closing objection handler moniker is pretty slimy, all of financial planning is getting people to do something that they don't want to do for a benefit that they'll receive a long time from now. And so you've got to have a little bit of skill in motivating people. And sometimes that is putting a little stank on, hey, we need you to do that. You said you wanted to retire in 30 years. That means you need to save money into your Roth. And if you don't, you're going to be dead broke. You know, so there's got to be there's got to be a little bit of salesmanship in there in order to motivate people to do things on their own. Like the phrase says, if information was all that was required, we'd all have six pack abs and have a million dollars in the bank, you know. <laughs> I just I read the article yesterday. It's like, oh, just get to 12% body fat. <laughs> Problem solved. Ta, ta. <laughs> you don't even need to work on your core. If you're at 12% body fat, it looks like you did. So, you know, <laughs> problem solved. So from a career standpoint, you know, there's really kind of two paths, I think now. Well, maybe three. And there's the, you know, there's the sales side that still exists. You know, you can work on Wall Street and and do the brokerage side of the business and and kind of work on that angle definitely more sales oriented. In fact, I would say almost all of the independent brokerage firms, Merrill's, Morgan's, Ameriprise's, Edward Jones, you're very much incentivized for that sales stuff. If you don't have that, I think this is the big difference now versus 20 years ago. If you don't have that as part of your repertoire, easy for me to say, that was a tough one. If you don't have that skill set and you're a really good analyst or you're really good you know, investment, like CFA type person, you can be a great financial planner now, whereas before you would have failed miserably because you didn't have the sales skills. So now you can work for a firm. You can work for an investment advisory firm 
as an advisor working with clients with no responsibility to actually bring on new clients. You know, that business development role has shifted from being primarily the advisor's responsibility to somebody who's actually good at it, that kind of unique ability concept. And then, of course, you can, if you're, you know, if you want to, you can hang out your own shingle. There's lots of resources online for that. XY Planning Network is really great. But don't you think still it's best to maybe get your feet wet working in another firm to see kind of how the, how things get made, how things get done inside the industry ahead of time? Well, maybe, but there's so many resources now and groups and mastermind associations. And, you know, I mentioned XY Planning Network, you know, they're 12 or 1500 members strong. There's lots of people who started day one and can say, oh, these, these are the tools that I bought, or this is the cost that it, you know, that it was for me, or this is the programs that I thought were successful. This is the mastermind group that I'm in that can teach you this sort of stuff. So there's lots of programs and things that you can plug into now that, you know, that word around, but you have to, it's a different personality, right? I mean, if you're going to be a firm owner, that's different than being a financial planner. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I was thinking about that. The job has really changed. There's three jobs. One, and I agree with the sales stuff that knowing even if you're not uh, a commission-based advisor trying to <laughs> shoehorn the wrong products into somebody's uh into somebody's financial plan. I'm not saying all commission people do that. I'm just yeah, saying it's that it's just a way to get paid. It's fine. Yeah, I'm just saying that if you are that person, you definitely need to know sales techniques, but just convincing people to do what's best for their own goals. There still has to be a sale that no, this is the right thing to do. You have to know those techniques. But I think there's far more psychology now and maybe if you're even thinking about what classes to take, it's not just the finance classes anymore, OG. I think it's a lot of philosophy, psychology. I think there's a bunch of uh, teaching people how to cope with financial markets and with sticking with the plan and marriage a lot of counseling behavioral stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Lots of stuff yes. there. Well, it is. I mean, there's the behavioral side of finances is uh, growing for sure. It's like one part business owner and and taking entrepreneurship courses one part financial courses and having the acumen to know what's right and what's wrong in a financial plan. And then one part psychology philosophy kind of creates this, this career that keeps on giving. And maybe that's it. Maybe it's the diversity of all the things that you need to know that keeps people excited about this profession and in it for a long time. You know, I know you're trying to put a bow on this guys, but that last part, I like the way you summarized it with the one part, one part, one part, but I feel like, those aren't balanced parts or they shouldn't be balanced parts because if I join that with what OG just talked about where, you know, if information was the key, then I'd already have eight pack abs or 12 pack abs or whatever. How many packs there are? 16 pack. I don't even know what's under there. I can't even, they're gone. Yours is more <laughs> no of a idea. keg. <laughs> okay. Well, it's all under the protective coating, right? I mean, it's yes. hard to get beyond the protective coating. I'm a survivalist. Coating. I am a survivalist. But anyway, I would think, if all you did as a financial advisor was provide the information and all the logic that said you should do these things, then everybody, both advisors and clients, would be enormously successful. But it's that sales ability to say, which is probably, and, and what you're selling is really the, the human behavior element of the why, what's the motivation for you to do these things. That's the key to being successful. I would think you almost need to weight that skill set higher than the information side. Because the information is all available out there. I think you make a good point because if people know everything to do, but nothing gets done, then, uh, then, then, then what do we do all this for? Yeah. I think in any profession, not just financial planning, maybe this is a good place to leave it. Learning those sales skills to convince people to do what's in their best interest might be a skill that uh, all of us can work on, no matter what we're trying to achieve. Coming up next, Vincent Puglisi was a professional photographer. You guys see Vincent's pictures from the Super Bowl, World Series, NHL Finals, any of these? Just amazing. He has done so many great things. But like many people, he was just a financial disaster before he discovered on the radio some popular programs about finance and became addicted to that. But at the same time, not doing great in his life. We detailed all of that. The first time he was on the show, he pivoted to become not just successful with his money, but also very successful in his career. And uh, today he's going to talk about that, about what he believes can make us all more successful. But first, it is National Third Shift Day. We also have, uh, well, we got a company that did something largely on third shift. Doug, uh, what do we got? 
Hey there, stackers. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. You know, I used to work the third shift as Joe's mom's bartender. An estimated 3 million Americans now work third shift, which, little known fact, is 80% of why Denny's is still in business. One company that's often had a third shift is in Akron, Ohio. And way back in 1947, they announced the tubeless tire. My question is, what company was it? I'll be right back with the answer after I buy some blackout curtains and unplug my phone. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp. You know, life can be overwhelming and many people are burnt out without even knowing it. Symptoms can include lack of motivation, feeling helpless or trapped, detachment, fatigue, and more. You know, it's... <laughs> I just finished a long leg of our book tour and uh, 23 days on the road can make you very, very burnt out. And you think to yourself, are you working too much? Not taking enough time for yourself? And you know what? Uh, definitely. I'm ready for the break in the tour. I loved seeing so many great stackers. It was so fun. But definitely finding a little bit of balance it's going to be great the next couple of weeks. You know, I just mentioned that we associate uh, burnout with work, but that's not the only cause. Any of our roles in life can lead us to feel burnout. And BetterHelp Online Therapy wants to remind you to prioritize yourself. Talking with someone can help you figure out what's causing stress in your life. You know, it's funny. I begin every Monday with a discussion with my coach, Mary Lou. And if it weren't for having that person to talk to every week to help me, Reset the week, reset my time, make sure that I am ready to go. I don't know where I'd be. BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with a therapist so you don't have to see anybody on camera if you don't want to. Much more affordable than in-person therapy, and you can be matched with a therapist in under 48 hours. The Stacky Benjamin Show listeners get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash stacker. That's betterhelp.com slash stacker. Hey, stackers, I'm super excited to announce that the Stacky Benjamin Show is going to be part of this year's Dell Technology Small Business Virtual Conference, which kicks off May 10th. Small businesses are ready to thrive again and looking for resources to rise to the challenge. And that's why Dell Technologies has assembled an all-star lineup of podcasts, including us for the third year in a row to create a virtual conference to share advice and inspiration for small businesses. So whether you're working remotely or back together again, let Dell Technologies help safeguard your business with modern devices and Windows 11 Pro. Search Dell Technologies Small Business Podference on odyssey.com, Spotify, or Apple Podcasts starting May 10th. And be sure to tune in for not one, but two exciting Stacking Benjamins custom episodes on May 12th and May 20th. Hey there, stackers. I'm Michelin Man lookalike and professional night owl, Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. In 1947, the development of a tubeless tire was announced. That went much better than the 1947 version of the meatless burger. It'd take another 70 years for that to take off. But back to tires. Engineers had been struggling for three years to pressurize air within the tire walls. But they finally figured it out. And in 1952, five years later, the technology won patents. So, what was the company that invented tubeless tires? B.F. Goodrich. And now, a guy who's about to use his vocal tubes to chat with us about the power of connection. Vincent Puglisi. Vincent Puglisi, finally back in the basement. How are you, man? How are you, man? Doing great here. I'm doing fantastic, but I have to tell you, I've had so much fun with your book the last 24 hours. There are five sections to your book, and I'm reading section one, and you're still going in section one at 55 pages, and I'm enjoying myself. I'm like, wow, you tell so many good stories. Like, you're all about the stories. It's always been that way, and that's why I never considered myself a writer, and I think I pushed back against that whole writing thing. But I, I <laughs> That whole writing told- thing? Yeah, the whole writing, I, I just always told stories. And that's the way it was, whether it's through conversation with friends or family, and it's, that's how I got to communicate. So even back to when we were photographers, 
our business, you know, even though we were photographers, was it wasn't Elizabeth Vincent photography because Elizabeth's my awesome wife. Um, so her name went first, but it wasn't Elizabeth Vincent photography. We called ourselves Elizabeth Vincent storytellers mm. because that's what we did. So it actually helped me career wise because I never got labeled in a spot. I was never a photographer or a podcaster or a writer. I'm a storyteller. And when you're a storyteller, you can speak on stage and you can write books and you can do podcasts. You could, you could do all these different things. It makes you very fluid in your career. So it can go from one thing to another, but I never really thought about it until that came about. So yeah, that's, that's the way I communicate. But isn't it also how we learn? Like, I think we learn through stories much more than we learn from a bunch of raw data. Without a doubt. If I hear another seven steps to whatever. I'm like, I don't care. I'm not going to follow it. You know, I step two, I'm out. And it's like, <laughs> and, and somebody even said it to me, like, what's the like step-by-step -step manual to connecting with these people? That's what they said to me, like from the book. And I said, this is not a step-by-step. -step. It's not a manual at all. This is to make you think, and this is to challenge you. And this is also to just change habits. But the, the numbers, I just don't relate to that. And I think when I go on stage, I tell a story and you get everybody's eyes on you. What I get to do is I get to disguise the lesson inside the story instead of pushing the lesson on you. People come to me they're like, I was so entertained, but then I realized I could do that thing. I'm like, that's exactly what I'm hoping to do. But that's funny. I think that's the magic of podcasting. Well, it's, it's the magic of a well-told book. Like often fiction is better than nonfiction when it comes to books because of the fact that, that they can tell these stories that are super real if they fictionalize the characters. Yeah. The fun part to me is how do you take that to nonfiction? Like, cause we have great stories yeah, and we don't pay attention to them. We don't pay attention to the little stories in our lives, in our friends' lives. I mean, as you can see from the book, the stories of my life comprise this book. That's what happens. And, and I, I say, be careful because you're going to become fodder for my content. <laughs> like anything you say around me is potentially <laughs> going to be a podcast or a book. And I just want you to know that beforehand. And then, cause I'm like, wait a second. And my philosophy on that is if you do something good and positive, I will name you because I always believe in giving credit and putting people over. If you do something negative or really bad, I won't name you, but I'm going to tell the story. But I'll tell the story. And you read it. You, well, yeah. you do tell a story like that. I'm sorry, but you do tell a story like that at a Seth Godin event. You're getting ready to ask a question. The woman next to you grabs the microphone. Tell me that story. It's funny because it's on YouTube and I can even actually send it to you. It was recorded. So it's like, it's all right there. Yeah, I was, I was in the front row and, and it's what I want to do. I want to ask a question. I was very fortunate. Seth actually endorsed my book. So I went there and I brought the book to give him as a thank you. I gave him the book and, and he put the book under his chair. So I'm like all like geeked out. I'm like, my book's under Seth Godin's chair. Like I'm just like a, a fanboy. And uh, so we're in the front row and, and he's, he's doing q and I raised my hand at the same time a few other people did. And the microphone was going to me, but a woman like raised her hand. She goes, me first. She screamed out. And I was kind of like startled. I was like, okay. And then she got the microphone and then she says, you know, you're talking, this is what she said to Seth. She goes, you're talking about generosity and I'm thinking maybe I'm too selfish. So do you think, he's like, <laughs> <laughs> he's, she's like, do you think generosity is the answer? And he's like, well, I think, do you think being less selfish is the answer? And he goes, I think being less selfish is always the answer. I'm sitting there looking at her like, did you really just ask that question? You just screamed me first and grabbed the microphone. She said, I think I'm being too selfish. I'm like, yeah, I think I could agree with you on that one. <laughs> um, but that kind of really led to a, the beginning of this process of this book of just like, am I the same way? Have I done that? And, and selfish goals. That, that's how it started. Oh, no, no, though. Let's finish that story because she follows up that question. Well, she doesn't follow up that question. She asked that question, but Seth follows it up. When the microphone gets to you with something exactly the opposite, something very unselfish. The exact opposite. So I raise my hand and I say, and before I could say anything, he says, Vincent, tell us about your new book. And my heart starts like pound. I start sweating because the one thing I don't want to do is abuse a relationship like that. What does make, he do though? Like he did, he like, I get this picture in my head that he picks it up off the ground, off a seat and he's showing it to everybody. Yeah. He gets off the chair. He grabs my book. Totally unscripted. Like he didn't even know I was going to ask a question and he goes and grabs my and he holds the book up. And now all you see are these, these, these gasps from the crowd, like thousand people like, Oh my goodness, this guy's got his book held up for the cameras is being recorded. And he's holding it up. And I get a picture of Seth holding up my book. And I said, I said, no, no, that's not why I'm here. I had a different question. He laughed and he goes, I know I'm just trying to get you some product placement. 
And I asked my question about homeschooling and about traveling, which was a great answer that you gave. But I left there and I was like, that was an unbelievable lesson for me and for everybody. He's got a big platform and he could use it any way he wants. And he could use it just for celebrity or whatever. I'm nobody. I got my first book coming out and he took the time to think, listen, I'm going to hold his book up and I'm going to promote it for him when there's nothing in it for him. Zero and in it for him. Because there was zero in it for him. And because of that, though, I keep telling that story and I tell it over and over again because there's people listening to your show that might not have maybe not have heard of Seth. Maybe they will now. And it's my job now to promote that generosity because that's exactly the type of person that I want to be. And I think it's what so many of us were not trained to be. We were trained to think, get what you want, get what you need, go after your goals. And it's also friggin' selfish. It's so self-involved. And I think it's gotten worse. And I'm I'm trying to change somewhat of the culture with this because of examples like that. But it's such a counterculture, right? I mean, it's so to your point, it's so different to think that way. And it's difficult to think that way. I mean, Vincent, I know what I want. I know what mm-hmm. I need to make my brand go. And if if the idea behind my brand is just help a bunch of other people versus make my brand go, it might not go as fast. It might not. And it probably won't go as fast. And I think that's a lot of the problem. But this conversation is a perfect example of this is an example of doing it backwards the way most people do it. I was at your event two weeks ago in Tampa. Congratulations. First of all, 40 days on the road, stacked tour. I mean, amazing what you're doing. And it's so much fun. I, I, of course, I'm going to be there. But I, I didn't know we were going to have this conversation. And then to the crowd, you go, well, Vincent's going to be on, on the show. And I'm like, I didn't know it was going to be on the show. That's cool. I'm thrilled. <laughs> but it's not that I'm like, oh, how do I get on? How do I get on the show? It was none of that. It was the relationship over time being built through friendship and generosity and helpfulness. And over time, you, you develop your character. You have curiosity towards the others. You build a connection. With that connection comes collaboration, which is what we're doing here. And then creation, whatever you make gets better because of that, because you have the collaboration around you. Most people do it backwards. Most people build it. They have a podcast, they have a book and they write it and they record it and they go, I've got a pod. I'm going to do a a podcast launch day and nobody cares. And like three people show up and they go, well, why didn't, why does anybody care? And then they try to collaborate. And then you or me go, I don't know who you are. I don't trust you yet. Maybe I will. Okay. Maybe I need to connect with them first. Oh, maybe I'm being selfish and I'm not curious. Oh, maybe I don't have good character. Maybe my selfish goals away over my generous goals and people go about it backwards until they learn. And that's why I wrote this because it's really a backwards approach to doing all this, but it's the way that works because every great relationship that lasts the test of time kind of goes along this path. Well, and the frustrating thing for me is, is that a lot of the time I feel like it feels like a quid pro quo, right? You do something for me, I do something for you, and people are keeping score there. And those are my least favorite relationships. I can't stand it when, um, you know, I've had so many times where people will invite me on their show. And I know the reason why they want me on their show isn't that they want me and my voice and my valuable stuff. They want me on the show because of the fact that then I will invite them on my show. And it just, it just grinds me, just that nature. I mean, I feel like you make a great point early on about make sure your unselfish goals are prioritized ahead of your selfish goals. Cause you do the unselfish yes. ones first, you'll get all the selfish ones later. Like those will come. It all happens that way. If your generous goals, like for instance, like connection relationships, connecting others, being helpful. If that's the way you think things come back to you, you don't know when and you don't know how, and that's a hard thing to quantify. It's a hard thing for the engineering mind to say, well, give me the ROI. And John Rulin says it's perfectly, it's not about ROI, it's ROR. It's return on relationship. Mm. It's friendships. Things happen from that that you don't know, that you don't know when they're going to happen. You don't know if they'll ever happen. But if you put good stuff out there and you do it the right way, people will like you more than if you do it the other way. And, And you get to build each other up that way. It's, I can write this because I was that person for so long. Like I know the mindset of the selfish goals, going after what you want. I got all the stuff I wanted and it was empty. It truly was empty. It was all about me. It was all about what I need to get. And I see that in others. And you wind up becoming a little bit cynical about it, but I think it's a good cynical because I think it makes you aware. It makes you read the room. It makes you become better at it. And it actually makes you become more generous by doing this. But it's a challenge because it's not the way most of us are taught to do it. 
Can we go back to what you were doing, giving Seth a book? Because I'm reading your book and I've been doing this 40 city book tour and you write, you're like, yeah, I don't want to do a book tour because who wants my signature? And I'm reading that like, that should be me too. I should totally be, who the hell wants my signature? Like, really? Really? Like, I just want to hang out and drink a beer with people. Like, let's do mm-hmm. that. But, but do my signature. So you didn't even call yours for your first book. You didn't call it a book tour. It was a, it was a thank you tour. That's what it was. Yeah. Because I was like, we're in different spots, Joe, you, you, you built it up to be able to do this. You actually have people show up at these events, right? If I would have done that, who knows? It was my first book, right? I'm, I'm, I'm putting it out there. So we said, instead of doing that and going to Barnes and Noble and putting some type of thing out there and Hey, come sign my book. I said to Elizabeth, why don't we just kind of mix all the things that we want to do? We have three boys. We homeschool. Why don't we travel? go on a family adventure and do a thank you tour. Essentially go to as many people that helped us and just say, thank you. Just give them the book and say, thank you for what they did because it wouldn't be possible without it. And so that's what we did three months on the road. We saw you along the way, which was awesome. And the funny thing about the thank you tour was people still talk about that. People still mention it. I like, Oh, I could have done it the traditional way of a book tour, I don't know if I would have went to Barnes and Noble if anybody would have remembered it, but five years later, people still talk about that. That was non-promotional and it was really just about them and it, and it lives on. So yeah, some of those people, you gave a book to a guy named Dan Miller. Tell me about the inspiration these people gave to you. Cause you really don't cover this in the book, but I think it's really interesting. Where does Dan Miller fit into your success story? Dan's such an awesome story with this whole thing. I heard Dan in 2005, maybe. 2005, 2004, he was on, he was on Dave Ramsey show. Dave was talking about his book, 48 days. So I trusted Dave. So I trusted Dan collaboration. So I bought the book. I read the book. I read it multiple times. Then things started going online, right? Facebook starts. And we're talking four years. I'm listening to his podcast. I don't know him personally. He's a celebrity in my mind. And then he starts some online community and I bought a second book. So in the first eight years, I might've spent $40 with him. Not something that really invested a whole lot into it, but then he did some type of live event. Uh, it was Innovate or something at his, at his sanctuary. He spent $1,000. He had built trust over eight years. Then there was another event, and I was happy to spend the money. And through that, and through, I guess, success with what I was doing, we became friends. We became friends, and I joined his mastermind for a while, and I was a part, I'm part of his community. And now we live 20 minutes from each other. We have lunch quite often. And we collaborate back and forth. So somebody that was a mentor and an idol in my mind for a long period of time has become a friend and still a mentor. But it it went over time with that, where then eventually when we're going on this tour, of course, we're going there, we're, you know, having him meet our family, we're giving him the book and just thanking him and lifting him up for all all he had done for us. Something else I was thinking while you're just talking there that I feel like a lot of the time that people that get help are people that that don't need it. And, and maybe they do need it. Maybe you did need Dan's help. But I feel like Dan's more likely to come talk to you because of the fact that you are somebody who is so helpful to him. You know what I mean? It's not that you're no. it's not that you're just begging him for help. It's that you no. made yourself useful for that. And that might be bad. That might make Dan sound horrible by that. But you know, no, no. you know what I mean there? I, I think there's a part of that that is I can imagine the amount of people that reach out to Dan Miller or that reach out to you in terms of looking for advice or feedback, or they want you to kind of lift them up or whatever it is. And I think, and you've seen this in in going to FinCon and different conferences, I think people look at people differently when they're willing to invest in themselves. Yeah. And it doesn't mean, oh, give me money, but I just know connections that I've made, social media marketing world, knowing that I'll spend hundreds of dollars on a plane ticket and hotels, and a conference ticket, and that time, when you sit down together, people look at you differently than somebody that's going to send you a DM. Like, this person actually cares. They actually invest in their stuff, and they're willing to invest in things that will not only help them grow, but also into the, the services that other people create for them. So there's so many people that want everything for free. They want the content for free. They want the advice for free. And I have no problem giving stuff away for free. I do it all the time. But I will tell you the people that are willing to invest in themselves, I can see them going so much further. And I think that's what happens when you can invest and you can get time with these people by doing that. You get to prove what you do. You get to explain it to them. So I think that's a big part of it. It feels like you're taking yourself seriously, right? I mean, if you're investing money, you're taking yourself seriously. Absolutely. And you're not, like you said, you're not looking to just get. 
I think people don't realize how many, once people like Dan and, and yourself get to the status, how many people reach out, how many people want your time. And the whole phrase of, I want to pick your brain. It's very insulting to me. I never say that phrase because I'm like, wait a second. Okay, Joe, I need something. You have a busy life and a family and a business. Let me just come over, suck stuff from your brain for an hour or two. I'll buy you a burrito. <laughs> and then, and then I'm going to move on. Like you might want to do it right? Because you're helpful. But I think it's, I find honor in saying, Hey, listen, you've helped me out. I want, I, I want to invest in what you're doing. If I trust you for that. I think when you do that, people that create stuff, appreciate that. You don't know how much I like burritos though. Like, <laughs> that, no could idea. it be worth it? You just say, Hey, there's a burrito on your doorstep, Joe. It's like, a, <laughs> you could pick my brain all you want for a, a super stack are, burrito. Are you kidding me? A little extra <laughs> cheese. I used the wrong term there. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, you talk about character. You begin with character because you say people get this backwards. Why do you begin with character? Because we've all seen people that have, you know, they have charisma and they have great products and they're well connected and they we've seen it fall apart. I give the example of Ken Lay from Enron who had it all and it all fell apart because of lack of character. He was using all of his influence to get what he wanted without help. It was very selfish, very self-involved. He lied. He was, you know, I say charisma is not character in the book. And I think that kind of stuns some people sometimes because we get fooled by charisma a lot. If you have a lot of charisma, you can make people believe that you're truthful and you're honest. And a lot of times it's not the case. So I think starting with character is the key because if you're, if your generous goals go above your selfish goals, if your if your character and your integrity is straight, the other things that you build upon it are so much easier to build. But if you build those other things without the character, if you're kind of shady there, we've all seen it. It's going to take time, but it does collapse. And that's why I start with it because it's foundational. I think I was late to this game. I mean, all I think about now is character. Like, who am I? Who do, who do I want to be remembered as? What is really important to me? Like, what are the things yep. that are super important to me? And character. But man, when I was younger... I made that mistake a ton where I thought that charisma was character. Like, Hey, if I can just make you like me, then I can do whatever the hell I want to do. Yeah. And, and man, just that difference. Like I'm wondering, I'm sitting here wondering, and this might be selfish. Like when the hell did I make that switch? And what made that switch? Like what made you make the switch from charisma <laughs> to character? It's such a great question to ask, because I think that's when you start figuring stuff out. I think it was around the point that, I had pretty much gotten what I had strived for and it was empty. I really think it was around them because I think for so long it was, if I do these things and there's somebody listening right now, I got to get my stuff. You don't understand. I got to get mine. When you get it, it's like the dog chasing the tail. You ever see a dog catch its tail? It's the most confused thing in the world. It never expected to catch it. It's running around. Like that's what people do. They're chased and then they catch it and they stare at it and they look around and they go, what do I do now? Yeah. What do I do with I this? Think, yeah. And I think that's what happened to me. And maybe that's what happened to you is you catch your tail and then you go, this isn't what I thought it would be. I remember we interviewed Deion Sanders. I didn't even put this in the book, but we interviewed Deion Sanders in my journalism career and his entire existence was based around winning the Super Bowl for decades. And then he played for the 49ers and they go to Miami, they win the Super Bowl. And he said in that locker room, he looked around, he was like, that's it. This is it. This is everything. And he got so depressed from it that he almost committed suicide in the off season, the following off season in Cincinnati, because it was so empty compared to what he thought it would be because he had his goals and his goals alone. And when he got it, it was not about anything else but him. And I've heard countless stories of people over and over that chased their own goals, got it. And were like, it's not what I thought. So I want to cut that off at the past because I was there on a much smaller scale, did the same thing and then realized it's not about that. It's really about like, how do you want to be remembered? Scott Bain in the story of my book about the auto mechanic who nobody knows who he is. Yeah. But can we he talk leads off my book? Yeah. No, tell this story. Cause this is a powerful story about somebody who's just an amazing person. You had a problem with your car and you take yeah. it in and, and you're sure it's a mechanic there. You're sure they're going to rip you off. Yep. <laughs> I say, I say not in your typical book. There's nothing more valuable than an honest mechanic. I think that's such a true life story because how often we were like, oh, it's a busted hose and it's going to be 1200 bucks. They could do whatever they want. I know how to turn the key in a car and turn on the radio at best. 
they could rip me off of whatever they, whatever they want. We took our car in because from a recommendation, which is kind of really goes along the line of all this. We go in and, and we come back and he goes, hey, it's just a busted hose. Here you go. And we're like, what do we owe you? He goes, it's just a busted hose. Don't, you don't owe me anything. Just get out of here. And he's talking to our kids and he's showing them around the shop. And I look around and he could have just got 300 bucks from us like that. Why didn't he do that? Character. It's the main reason why. He had character and he built and he developed relationships. Well, what happened was we recommend everybody to Bainan's in Bethel Park, Pennsylvania because of the honesty and the trust. Well, we keep going back and you, you spent, always the same you, thing. You spent tons of money with this guy then. Because Everything. of that free experience, you spent tons of money with him. We didn't hesitate because we trusted him. And he, and he continued to display the character. It wasn't like he did it one time and then he ripped sure. us off. Right. It was always the same thing. And he, <laughs> and, and he charged us, but it was appropriate. So he winds up bringing the kids into the shop. He's giving them like pretzels. He's like, you got a job here when you're ready to work. It was just a great relationship. And every time you met with him, you felt like you were the only one. Eye contact, not looking over your shoulder. And then one, one morning I'm working in the office and, and Elizabeth comes in and she's like, I think Scott Bainan died. And I was like, what? I just saw him the other day. And I look it up and there it is. He had a heart attack the night before and he's, he's dead. And how do we tell the kids? This is like a family member. They always look forward to going to see Scott. So we tell him we go to the, we go to the wake and it's just so sad. But and by the way, wasn't and by the way, just yeah. to put a, I want to stop right there. You go to the wake for your auto mechanic. Right. Like how many of us would go anywhere near the wake of our auto mechanic dies? Like, really? I'm, I'm going to that wake or that funeral. And we're not missing it. This is, we're not missing it. There's no way we are not going to be there, you know, for him and his family. We show up and like 10 minutes left from the time and the place is packed and it's just packed and people talking and telling stories. And it's sad, but it's also very happy. I mean, it's all stories about Scott. And I go up to Ryan, his son, who's now taking over the shop. And I was like, and I'm looking around, and I'm listening to these stories, and it's all the same stories that we felt. And I walked up to him and I joked, I'm not even sure if it comes across as a joke in the book, but I was like, I kind of thought we were special. And he laughed and he goes, you were, he goes, you know, he loved you guys, but he was like that for everybody. I left there that night and I was like, that was, I think you asked that question, when do you start feeling this? That was around the time that I started feeling it because I was like, I don't think with any of my accomplishments, if I died tomorrow, I'm having a wake like that. I don't think people are showing up like that for me. And that haunted me because I'm like, oh, he did this and he had this accomplishment. Nobody's showing up like that for me. And that really twisted my brain because it wasn't about the accomplishments and it wasn't about the numbers and the, and the vanity. He didn't care about any of that. He's in Bethel Park, Pennsylvania. And nobody else knew who he was. And he was just totally in that world. And he completely changed the way that I viewed this. That's, that was a big seed of the planting of this, of this project. As I'm listening to you, obviously I'm thinking about when did that change for me? And I'm thinking there was a couple times when I let down my family, I let down people close to me. And I remember thinking, okay, is this who I want to be? Like, is this the life I want to live? And it's funny when I then started lining up, like, who do I really want to be? Like, who do I want people to, so people at my funeral, what I want them to say about Joe and it wasn't yep. that he's a charismatic dude, right? That he walks in a room and, hey, everybody likes him and he's a lot of fun and whatever. No, it's about that he does what he says. He's a member of his community. His kids can rely on him as somebody that they can go to for help. I want to be a resource for my kids. I want to be remembered as active. Like I started writing these things down that were important. And man, that just changed everything. And I love this idea that it's not charisma. It is character. And you know what's funny? As I'm thinking about that too, a lot of people think they don't have charisma. And I think if you live a life that is character filled, like the charisma comes from the character, you know? Totally. Totally. That's a great point because I don't know if Scott was charismatic if I think back on him, but he had so much character, but you couldn't help but like him. And what do you want? Do you want to, I think there's such this influencer world now that it's like, people think you need to be this. You need to be that. Like, how about we start with character? How about that's a foundational piece and the other stuff can come after that. Yeah. You could become better on video. You can do all those different things, but if you don't have this stuff, if you're going to be, you and I both know this, how many people in this world are one thing on camera and different yeah. away from it. Yeah. That's not character. That is pretend charisma to get a certain thing. And if you can't match that in your life, if people don't say you're the same off camera as on, this is a problem. 
I want to talk about curiosity just briefly, which is the second point. If, if you and I talk through all five of these, it'd be an 18 hour interview, which would be a blast, <laughs> by the way. Every time you and I talk, I'm like, I just need another six hours of Vincent and, and okay. uh, we'll be good. Curiosity. There's a great lesson about curiosity. You're a baseball fan like I am. Baseball season is now rolling as people are listening to this. So, but you're a Mets fan. You're a long suffering Mets fan. Suffering. It's painful. Painful. Why didn't I choose the Yankees is the first question. <laughs> should be the first question of that story. I have championship every other year, but I choose the Mets. This is the year. Yeah, right. I don't believe any of that stuff anymore. <laughs> I'm, a Detroit, me I'm, a, I'm a Detroit Lions fan, so I know exactly. Oh, I'm, sorry. Which, I'm next, sorry. At least we have one. Yeah. You guys are still waiting. For oh, me. man. But tell me this story. You are, are you skipping school in this story to, to go watch a Mets game? Yeah. So the Mets, their only time they won. 1986, I watched like every game. It was the greatest season in the history of sports for my life. It was the New York, talk about charismatic with lacking character. The 1986 Mets were that team. They didn't, they had problems, but they had a lot of charisma and they were the best team to watch. So they win the World Series. They beat the Boston Red Sox. If baseball fans remember, it's the Bill Buckner ball through the legs World Mm. Series. You know, I'm 14 years old and it's everything to me. And they win. So I want to go to the parade in New York City. And my mom won't let me. You're not going to New York City by yourself with a million crazy people. It's like she made it sound so like insane. I thought it sounded normal. Why can't I just go? She wouldn't let me go. So that night we're watching the highlights of the parade on television. And my mom, all all she could say is, look how cold everybody looks. Aren't you glad you didn't go? And I wouldn't speak to my mom for like three days. I was so mad that that I couldn't go. But six months later is opening day for the Mets. And I'm like, I have to go. So I'm wearing my parents down. They're saying no. And I got nobody to go with them. And, and why my dad didn't take off to take me to the game is still a question I need to ask him today. Why we didn't go to that game together. So it's a day game. And they say, okay, you can go if your friend, if you get somebody to go with you. So I enlist my friend, Scott, who doesn't care about baseball to go to the game. My parents leave for work that morning. I go to Scott's house and Scott tells me he's not allowed to go. His mom changed her mind. And I've heard the phrase, it's better to ask forgiveness than permission. I'd heard that phrase before. You're going anyway. Never actually actually (laughs) used it. So I stood on my front lawn. I'm like, what am I going to do? Go to school now? I would be the lamest person in the world if I had this day to do whatever I want, Ferris Bueller style, and I'm not going to go. So I get on the bus and I'm like, I'm going to the game. Whatever happens, I got $30. I get on the bus and then on the second bus, it's just me and the bus driver and this just big Italian guy, big mean looking Italian guy. And I get on the bus and halfway, like a few minutes into the bus ride, he looks at me, he goes, shouldn't you be in school? And I'm like, I'm going to the Mets game. I'm just sitting there by myself. And he says, uh, by yourself? He goes, do you even have a ticket? And I'm like, I'll get a ticket at the game. I'm getting nervous now. He's like kind of yelling at me. And then he goes, how much money you got? This, he goes, this game's been sold out for months. Hottest ticket in town. How much money you got? He's just inquisitive, just questioning me. And I'm like, I got $30. He laughs at me, just blows me off. I, I'm just so glad he's not asking me any more questions. I go to get off the bus. I want to get away from this guy. And he stops me and he says, hey, kid. And he points at me. He goes, come, come here. And I'm like, yeah. He goes, okay, when you get to Shea Stadium, go to gate B. Ask for Vito Laterulli. You tell him Funzie from the waterfront sent you. And I'm like, <laughs> what? <laughs> so I get off the bus. He goes, you got it? I go, I got it. And he goes, now go. Like order, orders. He goes, now go. So I get off the bus and I get I have one more train to take to get to Shea Stadium. So I'm sitting on the bus, the, the train the whole time. And I'm like, I'm not doing that. But I kept saying Vito. I kept saying their names over and over again. Like, I don't want to forget their names, but I'm not sure. doing it. Yeah. So I get to Shea Stadium and it's packed. It's just people wall to wall everywhere. And I'm like, oh, I'm not getting a ticket. Nobody's selling a ticket. Everybody's looking to buy. So I kind of shrug my shoulders and I go, well, I'm not getting into the game. I don't want to get on the train to go back home. I'm going to go to gate B. So I go to gate B and this is old, you know, just old guy, wrinkly at, at the gate. And he looks at me. I don't even say a word. He goes, what do you want, kid? He yells at me. I, I asked, it's Vito here. And he yeah. goes, who's asking? I said, I said, Funzie from the waterfront sent me. I'm pointing to nobody. I'm pointing behind me. Like Funzie's behind me. <laughs> this guy back over this here. And back over somewhere. Here, somewhere. And I look down. I'm so nervous. I see his hands. I think I'm going to get, maybe get in trouble. I don't know what's going to happen. And he opens the gate. And I'm like, what? He goes, come on in. So now I'm in. And he goes, wait right here. He gets in the radio. And like two minutes later, this nice woman comes down with a clipboard. She goes, follow me. You got to be kidding me. I'm, I'm now in the walking up the, the ramp. She goes, you hungry? I'm like, sure. And she goes and gets me a hot dog and a soda. She goes, you want a program? I'm like, 
sure. She gets me, I'm like, this can't really be happening. She gets me a program. We start walking towards the seats now. And this is an ending. This is still going. We start walking down the steps. I can see the field. They haven't gotten the rings yet. They're getting the, they're raising the banner this day. And she seats me down in the front row of the load section, right behind home, home plate. And she goes, have a great time. And there I was, like half an hour later, the Mets get their World Series rings. They raise the banner. Daryl Strawberry has a three-run homer. They beat the part, best day of my life. And I go home that night, and I'm looking for Funzie on the train. Don't see him. And I tell my parents this story about what happened, and they're, like, asking me everything. There's Because, you know, the beauty of no cell phones, they didn't know anything that was going on all day. My kids are so jealous that they can't do these stories anymore. Cause we you would have scared the hell out of me as a parent, though. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But they were totally cool. They were like, they're just telling me what's happening. So I tell them the whole story about the home run and the food and Vito and Funzie and everything. And my dad just has this look on his face and his mouth drops. And he goes, what were their names again? I said, Vito and Funzie. And he goes, where were they from? I said, the waterfront. Like it's nothing. Because if you don't know, you don't know. I go to my friend Scott's house to tell him what happened, show him the program. He freaks out, tells his mom what he missed. I come back home just innocent as can be. And I hear my parents talking, like whispering. And my dad says, he's got no idea that the mafia got him into that game. And I was like, (laughs) what? (laughs) But that changed. It changed my life. Because first of all, that story, tell about being a storyteller. I told that story for everybody want to hear that story. But it wasn't until years later that I realized, oh my goodness, Funzy got like my greatest dream accomplished. The one thing I wanted, the story that I keep reliving, and he didn't ask for anything. He didn't try to ask for money for this information. He didn't try to do quid pro quo like you were talking about. He was just curious. He asked three questions, told me his name, and moved on with his life. I've never seen him since then, but I can't stop talking about it. He's a huge character in your life. Totally. For 10 minutes. And we try all these things to gain attention and to be influential and to get into different things. All he did was ask questions, be curious, and then realize I have a connection that I can help this kid. And when I got off the bus, he left there not knowing what happened. And I have to tell the story because he could be alive right now. He could have been knocked out in a mob hit a week later. Who knows what happened to Funzy? He's going to bust your kneecaps for telling a I'm mafia a story. About telling the story. Yeah. Now the story's out there. That's... So if you see me gone, <laughs> at least I went in a fun way because it's a cool story. <laughs> But the whole thing was like, he just asked questions and I'm like, that's the way I want to be. I want to be curious about other people's lives. I want to open doors for them. I want to, like I talked about the book later on, get psychic compensation, meaning you put good out in the world. You don't know if good stuff's going to come back. But if you do that, you get this, Fred Klein taught me that you get the psychic compensation that good stuff is happening because of you and good stuff will happen to you because of it. You know, you hear a story once and it might be somebody's thing, but you hear it over and over and over and you realize it's a truth in life. And when I was speaking to Daniel Lamar a couple months ago from Cirque du Soleil, he said, listen, even if you're a huge taker, you got to learn to be a giver because you will realize that you get to take a hell of a lot more (laughs) if you're a giver. But I don't even, while I believe that, and I think, I I still think that might be a little cynical way to look at the world. You want to do it, right? It's not why you want to do it. No, no. But I do think that it's just a more fun way to live your life. Like I remember there was this, there was this receptionist in our uh, Southfield office, Southfield, Michigan office. And I used to visit a lot of financial planning offices and this was the worst receptionist of any. Her name's Linda and Linda was just rotten. She was bitter. She just didn't care. She was horrible. And the office manager was going to fire her and instead sent her to Nordstrom customer service training. And she came back from that, Vincent, and she was incredible. She she went from the worst to the best. And I remember asking her, I'm like, Linda, I got to tell you, man, I did not like you. And now you're one of my favorite people. You're amazing. She was charismatic. She exuded character. She was always curious about what I was doing, like these, all these points that you're talking about. But you know what she said that was really impactful to me? She said, I hated the fact that I hated my job every day. And what Nordstrom taught her was it was so much more fun to be selfless. It was just a more fun way to live your life, to get into what other people are doing, find out. And she's like, I don't even really do it for the clients. I do it because every day I come home to my husband now and I'm like, oh, guess what? The, the so-and-sos are doing this fun thing. Ooh, these people went on this great vacation. Oh my goodness. These people told me this story about how they got this raise at work. 
She's like, I just realized that the days went faster. My life was more fulfilling and I was making these friendships. So in, in some ways, Daniel Lamar is right, Vincent. It can be, it can be a little takey, but it's this big aha that it's just a more fun way to live. What a huge story though. I mean, what a, what a huge transformation. And that's the point that to get across there is like, you will enjoy your life better so much. by being less self-involved. Because think of it this way. I can tell you about depression. I can tell you about anxiety. I've been through all of it. You know, I've been through self-loathing, the selfishness. You want to know why? Because I'm focused on myself. It sounds so just woo-woo, but it's absolutely true. If I'm thinking about how do I help Joe or how do I help Karen or, or thinking about your story, if I go off this call and I tell Elizabeth that story that you just told me, and then me and my kids have a conversation about it, you know who I'm not focusing on? Me. You know whose problems I'm not worried about? Me. I have a lot less anxiety when I'm less worried about my own stuff. And then what happens is you give praise to her, to Linda, because of how, how great she is, makes her feel better, makes her do better in her job. You know, if she's going to get a recommendation in the future, it's going to come a lot faster now, which means she's going to get raises faster. She's going to get other opportunities faster. She's going to get a whole lot more faster because of that. And why this isn't taught in school, why this isn't just culturally more normal really hit me while writing this book because I'm like, this really would change so many of the problems that we have, but we're so self-involved and people don't like hearing that, but it's just true. It's just true. So, you know, I could be the bad guy on it, but I think it's the type of thing where it needs to be discussed more because, you know, I say it right there, you're selfish. The problem is you're selfish and people go, I'm really not. But as you go through it, it's so often that it is. And it's a hard thing to discuss and, and to, to look at. Well, the good news is you open up this discussion really in a great way. The book is called The Wealth of Connection. It's available everywhere, I assume. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. <laughs> I guess maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe. <laughs> it's some. It's places. It's online. It's it's being sold. So uh, yeah, it's it. That's the other thing too. It's like even with the book, there's so much less of a what am I getting from this? Like I joke in the book about being a, a non bestseller. I'm the only author. I believe that has non bestseller on their cover. It says Vincent Paglisi, non bestselling author, right across the top. Because, because uh, everybody is trying so hard to be a bestseller. And let me get this many sales on Amazon. And I'm like, I'm so tired of all that stuff. Tired of it. I don't care. It's not why I'm doing it. And I think being unique is being a non-bestseller because apparently every other author in the world is a bestseller. So how do I stand out? By being a non-bestseller. Well, you always stand out anyway. Thanks for hanging out with us and talking about everything from courage to character to, man, well, to the wealth of connection. Thanks a ton, man. I appreciate you, man. You're awesome. I'm Rocky Lalvani, the Profit Answer Man. And when I'm not helping small businesses stack Benjamins for themselves, I'm stacking Benjamins for myself. Big thanks to Vincent for hanging out with us. Oh, gee, it, I, he nailed it. I mean, uh, it is, it is making connections with people. I feel that's very much the key to success. It's, uh, I mean, you hate the phrase, it's not what you know to, you know, but it really is. It really is how kind of the world works and you get your shot to show how you can do it if you know the right connections. The right connections will put you in the room to to shoot your shot, so to speak. You know? Well well oh boy. And and those those same connections are gonna be the people that when you do shoot your shot, those people are gonna be the ones that recognize it and amplify it to the world. This yep. idea of somebody working alone in a vacuum, whether it's collaborating with people to make something or to amplify the messaging. So it actually gets out to the world is all based on who, you know? Yeah. So I, I just feel like time and again, during my career, I've come across people like, no, 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 no. I'm going to do this by myself. I'm going to do this by my, and, and it's fine to want to learn it by yourself and to take the time to do it. I think you're going to get in the weeds. It's going to take too long. You don't understand how valuable your time is and moving on to other stuff. If you want to do that, fine. You still have to surround yourself with good people. And you never know when those connections are coming. No I, idea. I mean, so I don't know if, if we want to use this example or not, but at the Cliff Dwellers Club, when we were in Chicago, my son came along and he didn't want to come. I know he was humoring me. He, you know, dad's got this thing, so I'll go. I ended up speaking with David Hirsch, 
great guy. You know, big, huge thanks to him for for helping us connect with the Cliff Dwellers Club. And we're making chit chat. And he says, you know, where's your son work? And I told him and his eyes opened up wide and said, you're kidding me. One of my fraternity brothers founded that firm. So then we walk over and talk to talk to Tucker and make that connection and then find out, you know, natural conversation. What's your fraternity? My son's same fraternity. So they're fraternity brothers. Not only he, he didn't realize he was a fraternity brother with his own firm founder, but also with David Hirsch. So it was just that that organic connection that just happened. He didn't even really want to be there. But there are times in your life where you have to put yourself in those situations to interact with other people, to stumble upon those connections. Sometimes they're, you're going to get really deep ones. It's that famous line that 90 percent of success is often just showing up, right? There you go. Perfect. The fact that he's in the room and didn't yep. want to come in the room. Who Who knows? Uh, thanks for hanging out with us and for taking time again out of your day. We're having a great week next week on Thursday, Northwest Arkansas, Bentonville, Springdale, Fayetteville, Rogers. We are coming to the Fayetteville library with our friends at acre trader sponsoring that the big thanks to acre trader for helping us put on that event. That's Thursday night. And then Saturday night, our friend, uh, Sarah Catherine Gutierrez putting on a fantastic event in little rock. Uh, stackingbenjamins.com slash stacked scroll down to the tour dates click on northwest arkansas or little rock uh, to meet emily and i in both of those cities going to be a great time emily and me but sure emily and me me and emma with people in arkansas and the emily uh <laughs> stackingbenjamins.com slash stacked uh, but if you're not here for surround sound, you are here specifically because you need to think bigger about your goals. OG and his team are taking clients. So head on over to stackybedjamins.com slash OG. That's a link to their calendar. And we'll get you set up for thinking bigger about your goals this year and in the future. All right. That puts a bow on today. Mr. Doug, what should we have learned today? Well, Joe, first, take a note from Vincent Puglisi. Managing your connections is essential to growing your wealth. Want more money? Connect with a wider range of people. Second, thinking about becoming a financial advisor? That's one part financial acumen, one part psychology, and one part business owner. Added together, that equation will equal a great career. But the big lesson? You know what my favorite third shift is? Sending my money to work while I sleep. I love it when my Benjamins are working third shift. Great investing, peeps. Thanks to Vincent Puglisi for hanging out with us again in the basement. His book, Power of Connection, is available anywhere you connect with friends. This show is the property of SB Podcasts, LLC, copyright 2022, and is created by Joe Salcihai. Our producer is Karen Repine. The show is written by the brilliant Paulette Perhatch with help from Joe, me, and Doc G from the Earn and Invest podcast. After you listen to our show, check out the 201 Deep Dives written by our website manager and blog editor, Brooke Miller. You'll find the 411 on all things money at the 201. Just go to stackingbenjamins.com slash 201. Once we bottle up all this goodness, we ship it to our engineer, the amazing Steve Stewart. Steve helps the rest of our team sound nearly as good as I do right now. Want to chat with friends about the show later? Mom's friend Gertrude is our social media coordinator and the room mother in our Facebook group called The Basement. So say hello when you see us posting online. Here's a weird fact. Both she and Tina Eichenberg are never in the same room at the same time. To join all the basement fun with other stackers, type stackingbenjamins.com slash basement. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and we'll see you next time back here at the Stacking Benjamin Show. Not only should you not take advice from these dorks, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making any financial decisions, speak with a real financial advisor.
by the time people hear this, I would have just gotten back from my trip to Egypt and Jordan. I haven't actually gone yet as we record this. So I thought we could start talking about it early. So we get to hear about it. you. What? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, okay. How is this going to work? I said that to the it's guy. It's going to work great. There's a guy in uh, Milwaukee that I met, and I said something about recording early. I said, well, Joe's going on trips pretty soon. I said, he hasn't really told anybody yet, but he, he goes, where's he going? I said, Egypt. He goes, oh, so this is going to be like the Bavaria trip. We're going to hear about it for six months. I go, <laughs> this is exactly going to be like that. Also, I have one other thing to uh, tell Scott, who was there in Austin, uh, not Austin, Aurora, that indeed my nephew is in the same fraternity as you were, you know, because he's not there anymore. So I told him I'd tell him in the after show. You told the guy you were giving him a a shout out. Yeah. If, in fact, my nephew, because we were talking, he went to Michigan Tech, blah, 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 blah. He was a great dude. I remember him. That guy from Michigan Tech was a great guy. Yeah. So because of that, I said that. He said I was his favorite part of the show. That's why I remember him. But I didn't realize like we could use shout outs on the show as currency. What are you talking about? I'm totally going to do that. I didn't now. get anything for it. No. Oh, right. You didn't get anything for it. Hey, I'll say I'll mention you for 10 bucks. <laughs> yeah. Don't we Absolutely. don't we already do that? Brought to you by <laughs> Oh, there's that. I forgot about That's that small. part. I think uh, Westwood One would have an issue with it. Hey, people at Navy Federal Credit Union, I'll shout you out, man, <laughs> for a little bit of something, something. Like, we already do that. Anyways, Joe, tell us about your trip to Egypt that you're not on yet, but you're about to go on. <laughs> Is it hot there? I w- <laughs> oh, I'm sure it's boiling uh, uh, right now, or was boiling while I was there. I have to say this. One thing that was pretty funny that I I, I can't wait to verify is when we get to Cairo, which is the end of our trip and the Great Pyramids. Have you guys seen where the best view, apparently, according to some travel bloggers, of the pyramids is from? It is from a Kentucky Fried Chicken. There's a second floor seating area at a Kentucky Fried Chicken right on the edge of of Cairo, and you get this amazing view. So you get your extra crispy, and you sit down. And you get this gorgeous pyramid view. Was it packed? Did you have to wait in line for a long time to get up to see that second floor and get that view? Do, do, do I make this up now? Yeah. Yes. I, I totally yes. want to because I don't want to compare it to the real trip. I think we just turned this into a prediction. This is you be actually, hilarious. You actually think on the real trip, I'm going to go verify that the Kentucky Fried Chicken. Hell yes, the, if you don't by now, because I've heard place. this story six times. You have to f- go to that Kentucky Fried Chicken. <laughs> Get an inside look at Hollywood with Michael Rosenbaum. Let's get inside of Mark Paul Gosler. How hard was it, by the way, working on a series like NYPD Blue? Glad I'm not like walking onto a show that like that now because with all social media and everyone has an opinion and early 2000, there was one guy with a blog. I just remember reading that I was going to bring the franchise down. Uh, I was horrible. And by the way, I thought they were right. Inside of you with Michael Rosenbaum. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. 